Very specifically in a little better shape. Uh, myself, I'm, I'm Daniel Vetcher, I'm the Colonel Maintainer since about two years. I haven't given up on the job and rich quite, but yeah. And I work for Intel's OTC since uh, three years or so. So the Intel graphics driver, um, I think that was our claim to fame for the first two, three years. We totally dominated the regression list. And that was for the very few people who actually were lucky enough to have a working mode setting driver with all the shiny new kernel mode setting stuff and gem. Uh, so even if you were lucky, uh, we made damn sure that the next kernel would be broken for you. <laughs> and, and obviously that's kind of not the, not the thing you want to have. So. We, we also continuously like broke the same things again. We had like the same box pop up all again. So it was like 200 patches for the Intel driver, 50 patches, new features, and 150 trying to stitch it together again, all those things. So we, we had to do better than that. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about, because we're kind of not at the top anymore, at least in that metric. And the first thing we started with was or have some test cases at least. A, a little bit of more uh, formal testing, more than a compiled shepherd. And my first realization was uh, there's literally no test suit that's worse than no test suit. Like, there seems to be no bottom to how bad you can be, and it's still useful. Or at least we didn't bottom out. Because the first thing we had was a bunch of hacked together test applications used to like design gen and uh, a few micro benchmarks hacked together with Automake's test runner infrastructure. And that was the first test suite we had in the actual cold box. So with that, we kind of stored it and did a lot of other things too. So what I'm going to talk about today is. Uh, First, the kind of process changes we've done, like don't ship it if it compiles. Uh, the next one is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the test infrastructure that we reinvented because uh, every other wheel kind of didn't look too appeasing. And the, the third topic is uh, talking about specific test techniques for, for testing kernel, drive, uh, kernel graphics drivers because there's an awful lot of stuff uh, that you kind of, or traditionally you kind of need to have eyes looking at a screen to see whether it works correctly because that kind of stuff or also uh, other interactions, kind of GPU specific stuff, like they actually tend to hang a lot. So you need to have a reliable reset and how you can test that. So. Pretty much one of the first things we've done is uh, instead a rolling next branch, which uh, looked like, essentially the, the, for me there's no merge window. I, I just merge patches all the time. And every two weeks I, I tack it, I tack it. I, I send that off to our QA department, actually wait for the test results, and then if they say it's not totally broken, I forward it up upstream to Dave, to, to, to the DRM maintainer, uh, and he integrates that, e except for the merge window, then it's just star. Well, one of the nice things is we actually used the QA's feedback, and it was not like we got the QA bug report at the same time as Linus Torvalds was screaming at us. So that's a good improvement. The other thing was also there's, there's no patch build up. So because the thing is just rolling, the, the cutoff is out of my hands, so if managers come around and tell me, you really have to integrate that, I can just say, well, sorry, it's kind of gone already, and there's like the, two, the one week uh, delay for the QA and the merge window happened, so that allowed me to put off a lot of pressure. So that's, that's kind of the, the process changes we've done. The other thing was, uh, Nowadays, tests and testing is kind of integral to the development process. There, there was a lot of fodder for flame wars the past year. But essentially, what uh, I require now for patches to get merged is 
If you're adding a new interface, I want the full interface testing, all the corner cases, all the overflows, all the invalid flags, checking that all that testing is kind of done, which, which helps a lot for designing sane APIs. So we, we stop doing stupid things like not checking for flags and then user space, or submitting random garbage in these additional spare fields and so we can't actually use them. Uh, it's, it's also often done as part of the review nowadays, so like if someone writes a patch and we kind of try to uh, teach someone else about this topic, he, he's, he's not going to just do the review, but also write some test cases, kind of as, as a learning experience. And, and the little thing is, I mean, this kind of testing for the, the ridiculous box that we occasionally hit, and, and they I mean, there's some people who, who believe in test-driven development, like uh, write test cases first and then fix it. The, the problem with the kernel is there's so, such a combinatorial explosion of things that can go wrong. It's, it's an eternal task. And I also think it's a stupid idea because then people just try to make the test cases pass and then think about what they're doing actually anymore. So the approach we're currently using is kind of book-driven testing. So we, we try to do a base coverage of exercise the driver or a new feature somewhat. And then if something actually blows up, we write a test case for that specific thing. And it seems to be fairly good at, at kind of directing the testing efforts into a useful direction. Because yeah, if, if, if you just, there's just too much things that can go wrong. <laughs> So it's, it's much better to test what actually goes wrong in the real world. So that, that was kind of the, uh, the, the process changes. Uh, we also had to like create a, a infrastructure stuff. Nowadays we use a Piglet as a test runner framework, which is uh, something the Mesa guys started years ago and is extremely useful for them. It, it has two parts, Piglet. One is the actual OpenGL and OpenCL test case suit. We obviously don't use that. But there's the Python test runner. And uh, that port is uh, what we use. Um, one reason for choosing Piglet besides that uh, uh, everyone else in the open source graphics world kind of uses it. And it's also, it, it also has like test run the wrappers for all kinds of other things. The, the really old X-Test suite is a wrapper now, thanks to Eric Anhold. The, the, the Kronos GL-conform test suite can be run through that thing, so we kind of use that for everything. Uh, well, when I looked around two years ago for, for potential test suite runners, they all kind of assumed that you're going to write new test cases and you don't have a pile of horrible C code that you want to reuse just because we had that around. So that was kind of a problem. And the other thing was all the test suits and runners I found were for testing like software, where you assume that if you write a test case, it, it, it'll always be able to run. But we, we, we're testing hardware platforms. so. A lot of the features are only available on some kernel versions, on some, on some hardware platforms, so we had to have skip support. Because otherwise, if a test case suddenly doesn't run, you, you want to know about that as a regression. So you need to track the, 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 skip, test, uh, the skip case uh, separately. So, and Piglet has, has all that, because it, it has all the, OpenGL is a version of the API and with massive amounts of extensions, so it needs that. And it, Piglet itself has a bunch of things. Uh, you, you can restart test runs if the machine died. Uh, it, it captures the DMESC, which is uh, used by us a lot because we, we try really hard that everything which is actually in error condition is locked as, as worn or above in, in DMESC, and everything which is not is, is actually just debug or, or info level. We, we, we have a lot of patches actually in that area to tune down old print case and debug leftovers from development where ioctals can, yeah, spam DMASK. Uh, it had a timeout 
support to kill like long running test suits in case the kernel ha hung or I mean yeah we, we have a massive span of hardware so running especially stress tests on some old platforms or, or some uh, dead slow embedded SOC platforms just takes too long so we had that but unfortunately Python has like or seems to have some concurrency bugs so we had to back that out and need to restore it. The Next part is uh, Intel GPU tools. That's where our kernel test cases actually uh, reside. It, it started in Intel GPU tools because we just reused these uh, kind of old test development vehicles, demo programs, and extended it. Most of the infrastructure in there, or at least in the beginning, was just IOCTL wrappers, just basic boilerplate code. Uh, but over the past, one and a half years or so, we, we reinvented our own uh, testing framework, mostly because of the reason I just said that the, the things that are there were kind of not too fitting for our use cases. So, uh, one, of, one of the big things is that uh, the test cases are pretty much just uh, binaries that, that are run and the exit code kind of tells us whether it's a skip or a, a, a success or a warn or uh, to, sh to make code sharing easier and reduce the boilerplate, we have a set of fairly nasty C macros that kind of give the entire test case a more uh, declarative uh, appearance. Uh, it is example, normal test case you store with IGT main block that contains code to kind of do option parsing, which integrates with, with for example, the Piglet test runner the Piglet test run only ever runs one subtest of each binary so that we can track results separately. Then you have a, like an IGT fixture text blo uh, uh, block which is only run if the test case is actually run. We use that, oh, our QA department uses or needs that to be able to enumerate test cases uh, on machines which don't have Intel graphics. So we need to block out all the, the, the hardware setup for the test case. Uh, the thing is, they need that for enumeration because we run the binary to enumerate subtests. And the reason for that is kind of the, the last thing. We have a lot of combinatorial subtests where, where we have a print, printf like format thing which, where you can use, which you can use to, to stitch together this, the subtest name from Flax or some other, yeah, some array. And so we, we actually need to run the test binary to, to get out the list of subtests. And that was kind of what, what we did, yeah, developed over the past year. We ha also have a lot, a, a set of uh, magic macros like the IGT require at the bottom. The IGT require automatically jumps out of the subtest and marks the subtest result as skip. There's an IGT assert which, uh, uh, fails the test case if, if, if the condition fails. We also have like the inverse ones uh, because I'm too stupid to invert Boolean algebra. So there's also a skip on and a success on. <laughs> yeah, I, I screwed it up a few many, too many times when, when, inst when refactoring all the test cases for that infrastructure. Yeah, so that's kind of what I talked about. We have these mac magic macros which jump out of, of these, these special C uh, blocks. They also work like, if you, if you have like an IGT require in the, in the fixture in the top level, it skips the entire thing. If you have a, a, an IGT require in a subtest, it just skips that subtest. Which is, and if you have like an IGT require in between two subtests, it, 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 it skips everything below, which is fairly useful because all of our platforms always extend kind of new features. For example, we have a uh, command submission rings, and uh, nowadays it's like four different rings. So we just have an IGT require in each one of them, and then s just skip all the newer ones. That's kind of how we, uh, yeah, how we use the thing. Uh, we we also have a of the main block. We have a simple test case block. If you kind of don't have a subtest, it's just kills one, uh, one, one shift level. Uh, the, the only kind of bad thing, essentially it's, it's, 
IGT require and IGT skip or, or work like uh, uh, exceptions and exceptions and say means you have to use set chump and lump chump. So uh, stack variables in, in, in function frames that contain IGT fixture or IGT uh, subtest blocks will get scrambled by JCC. So that's kind of the downside. But otherwise, it actually works fairly nice. Uh, the next piece of kind of helper infrastructure is uh, forking uh, test helpers and threats. I need the kernel, most of the box only happen if two things or three things or a lot of things happen in parallel. Uh, we have two cases. One is for forking uh, uh, test children. And if you fork a test children and the test children has like an IGT asset. Uh, the, the main thread rethrows that IGT asset and forwards it. That's, that's kind of the point uh, behind those. And then we have uh, another set of helpers for, for forking background tasks. Uh, for example, if you want to do something nasty to the system in general or to your test cases in the background, uh, we use those and then uh, at the end of the test case just call them. And one of the reasons why we have that is that uh, Lipsy has a nice race between the fork and this, the signal handling re-racing because it caches the, the pit of the process. So that's kind of papered over in these helpers. Uh, yeah, for an example, what, what that look like, what, 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 what's that going to look like in the test case? At the top, there's a block. Well, yeah, but like, you, like I said, which you could use to do nasty things, for example, just trash a little bit of memory. Uh, and then IGT fork is the real test children thing, which kind of works like an OpenMP for loop. So you, you give it the number of, of, of processes to span, and yeah, it's, it's like a, a for loop from child equals zero uh, until less than a in this example. And like I said, IGT acid gets forwarded. And then in the main thread, you, you have to wait for all the children and at the end also kill the helper. And the next thing which integrates with all that is as exit handlers. Oh, is it, does it talk too much in there? Nice. Uh, I mean, with all these uh, process helpers, we, we have a lot of debugfs interfaces in the kernel to kind of change the system. We, we want to un undo that damage for the next test case or if the test suit crashes or something. So we, ha we have exit handlers which, which are uh, run with that exit libc infrastructure and that uh, when, it, when a signal happens or so. That's the reason why we stumbled over the fork versus race race because uh, we use these signal handlers and uh, yeah, it works together with the fork helpers. So uh, if you fork a sub-thread, that doesn't try to clean up the stuff from the main thread, but it will clean up all your helper processes if you forget to do that or yeah, crash trying to do that. And it's mostly used internally with, with special purpose helpers. Some of the testing techniques that I'll, I'll discuss later on kind of to clean up internal state so that the actual test case just says, do this special thing and then forgets about it. And at the end, everything will get magically cleaned up, cleans up the, the source code quite a bit. Uh, and finally, there's, there's a lot of boring boilerplate removal stuff, just uh, dealing with kernel mode setting is kind of boring. You have like five ioctals to get at the state, even just like figure out what kind of hardware is there. Uh, we have helpers to create a frame buffer according to what you wish, whether you, it needs to be tall, the size, and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, yeah. Also kind of helpers trying to, to figure out the valid configuration if you say, I want this connector on this pipe, figure it out somehow, or I want this pipe, and yeah, give me something that works. Uh, SysFS and DebugFS access helpers because everyone loves to invent in some place. All uh, uh, option parsing, mostly for the test suite, so that the Piglet test runner can say, 
please run this subtest and that all kind of magically happens. Bunch of other things. Uh, so that's kind of what we have in, in user space. Uh, we also have added in, over the past two years a, a lot of infrastructure to the kernel for better testing and validation and that's uh, the mode set state tracker. I think, I think I've presented about that a few times already. It, it essentially what it does is double check the hardware state with what the software believes it should be. And uh, two years ago, we had the output writing state, so checking whether the VGA connector is actually connected to the right pipe and CO2 say, or whether some mix up happened there, which we've all kind of seen. And since this year, we also track like the entire pipe configuration state, so <coughs> at what pixel depth your pipeline's running, whether it's six bits per pixel or eight, and that kind of stuff. All the clocks, all the special things like. Uh, for example, is, is, is an audio channel being ratted over that pipeline for HDMI, or th things like that. All the internal clock setup is, or most of the internal clock setup is tracked nowadays. So, yeah, how did we kind of get there? I mean, the mode set state checker essentially has uh, a two components that we need anyway. We need to be able to read out the full hardware state that's left behind by the firmware or by the BIOS uh, for fast boot so that we can seamlessly take over the hardware. Uh, we need to pre-compute the entire display state for atomic mode set because one of the things or the entire goal of atomic mode set is to figure out whether a new configuration is possible before touching the hardware, which currently we can't do. We, we're getting there. So with these two ingredients, we can get the entire hardware state and we can pre-compute the entire hardware state. If we use the same data structures for both things, we can just add a little bit of code to compare these two things. And, and that's essentially how the state tracker is implemented. So it's very little code. It's, it's one function with like a pile of macros that just compare uh, uh, struct members essentially with some with a few if conditions for special cases, and it's it's pretty impressive how much crap that thing catches. Like I think since we added that two years ago, we we the. It, it uses a warm backtrace so that users actually notice that something went wrong and report the bug because most often the screen kind of still works, the hardware kind of gets along, but we screwed something up someday. And since we added that thing, uh, I think we had the top backtrace score point on Federer ever. Like, just the, always. So there's a lot of bugs and we kind of constantly try to fix them. And then in the next release, we add a little bit more state tracking or a little bit more complexity. And then we again at the top spot for uh, back traces. But that caught a lot of, of kernel mode setting, corner cases and bugs and little things because uh, the amount of diversity is, is just astonishing. And you kind of can't test that, at least not with the resources we have. So that's kind of the internal infrastructure we have, which uh, now comes to the third part, kind of our special testing techniques that we, we're using to to bait on the on the graphics driver. The, the first thing is our. Uh, Pretty much everywhere in, 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 in graphics code, eventually in the kernel, you need to stall for the JPU to do something because you run out of space and it, it, it's all active buffer objects and you need to evict something or so. And generally, you kind of want to make these block, uh, these weights interruptible so that if the JPU hangs or you, something else is broken, users can actually uh, kill the process. Which means you can actually use signals to test all your error paths. 
because really pretty much every single thing, every call chain in the kernel eventually ends up blocking on the JPU. So what we use extremely often is uh, just fork a second helper thread, which constantly sends uh, signals to the first one, and so constantly interrupts the kernel, and that's kind of how we use to uh, test error, error path. At, at the beginning, we kind of did that just with X, because X uses signals a lot. Uh, and yeah, we then formalized that in our test cases. So nowadays, uh, pretty much all the test cases which do something non-trivial have like two subtests. Well, one's the normal one, and the other one is the one where we fork the signal helper to, to beat on the kernel a bit more badly. A another thing that we needed to, 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 to kind of exercise at the kernel fully is uh, have a debug of S to, to this old pre faulting because gems supposed to be fast, or at least the, the command submission part, so we have an entire cascade of two, three, four, sometimes fallbacks pass with a false path, which kind of assumes that everything is there already, nothing needs to be faulted in, and then, a, then an entire chain of fallback paths. And you can, you can test that pretty easily by, by giving the, the kernel a pointer which you know uh, doesn't have PTs yet, and we just do that by by handing it uh, one of our own buffer objects, because we we c we know about the lifetimes of those and the page folding behavior. But the very first thing every 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 gem IOCTL does is like prefold the entire thing. So we have a debugfs knob to disable that, so that we can still reliably test all the slow path and the fallback of the slow path and the recovery. Especially the relocation code is extremely mad about that stuff. And we had some good bugs in there. Some, so, well, bugs of the, of the kind where Linus Torvalds kind of hates me for it. So those I kind of want to avoid. Uh, another thing which is fairly recent as uh, this place, your sees checksums. The, the hallway has, uh, I guess the, the, the hallway guys use that for validation and stuff, has an, a massive pile of, of little checksum uh, units that you can use to grab a, a checksum of an entire frame at, at different tap points. And uh, we expose that through debugfs with a, a little bit of logic in the kernel, so you just tell tell the debugfs saying, I'd like to get uh, CRC checksums for this, pi this CRTC, uh, for this pipeline, and it figures that out. The problem with that is, or why we kind of need quite a lot of kernel logic is it's, it's interrupt driven, so it needs to be in the kernel. And depending upon output configuration, you need to select different tap points. For example, on, on Bay Trail, uh, with display port, you need to select the display port tap point because the normal pipe tap point is kind of disabled. And uh, another thing we need to do there, if you, if you like use display port tap points, uh, display port just scramble the output signal to, to avoid uh, I interference. Uh, so we, we, we set a debug option in, in the regis in the in display port output to disable that scrambling, kind of drive the display port in a non-standard way, just so that we have stable frame checksums, restart the scrambler every frame. So essentially, it's, it's supported on all outputs and platforms on, on every generation we've ever seen. Uh, te writing test cases with that thing is, uh, is a bit of a challenge because you can't actually I mean, in GL, for example, you render something and then you read back the pixel and check whether it's red or green. You can't do that with CRCs. The only thing you get is like this, the checksum of the entire frame. So the only thing you can do is create a frame, grab a CRC, create another frame and compare the two frames. So either they're equal or they're not. So have you used that for testing? For example, you, you, you make the entire screen white and then you, you render a black cursor, and then you move it one pixel in, 
if the, if, if the CRC checks some changes, then you know the, the cursor is being displayed. And if it doesn't change, you know the kernel has an off by one error and cuts the cursor one pixel road or, or too early off. And that's actually a bug we had. Or uh, we, we also want to use that for uh, sprites for, for video display, kind of to check whether we position them correctly. You can draw the entire background frame in, in a color and then stand, stamp out like a hole in black and then put the, the video frame in the same color on top of it. And if that's still the same CRC, then you know the color is still the same and it falls up perfectly out. And then you can, to check positioning precisely, you can move it one pixel up or down or left. And if it doesn't change, you know something with the scaling or so is screwed up. So that's what we're currently writing test cases for. And it essentially allows us to test the entire KMS API with cursor placement, frame buffer pixel layout, uh, offsets and all that stuff. All, all areas where we had nasty bugs. Uh, blending, once, once we get there, uh, color key and all that stuff. And yeah, bef before we had like these display CRCs, that was all things where we relied on uh, essentially users reporting regressions when we broke things again. So now we can all test that, it's fairly nice. So yeah, that's uh, what we can test now with these CRC checksums. Well, one thing is frame buffer compression, which historically has been always buggy. When we, we, we use frame buffer compression, it was always kind of a case where we missed the screen update and you just seen the old state in the compressed frame buffer and it just kept on scanning out that instead of uh, invalidating the compressed frame buffer and, and recompressing it. So now we have a nice test case and we actually uh, have proof that it's still broken. Uh, the same is, uh, uh, with, with these, especially with these high res the display panels, pa frame buffer compression actually isn't too good with saving memory bandwidth and that kind of stuff. So most panels, especially for mobile platforms, have like an onboard frame buffer and you only upload a new frame uh, when uh, something actually changed and otherwise the panel just scans out from its own frame buffer. Um, there's the same problem if, if you miss like a, a screen update, you, your cursor's never ever gonna move. So we have test cases for that now and again, it's kind of broken. And like I said, placement of cursors, planes, sprites, all that stuff, rotation and mirroring, that's all things that we can now fully, fully test in an automated way. So, makes me really happy as a maintainer. Uh, the other thing which is, I think is fairly interesting is, is the GPU hangman. Something which we actually have since two years now. And it works by essentially stopping command submission to hardware. So, we still do all the processing, we relocate all the buffers, we, we, we fill in the ring buffer, but we don't tell the hardware that something changed. Which means it looks like a GPU hang, but it's not actually a GPU hang, which has the upside that there's a much higher chance that your system actually survives the reset that will follow. And at the beginning, GPU reset kind of worked occasionally if you were lucky. But thanks to the GPU hangman, we uh, fixed countless of bugs. And nowadays, we also have a, a, a lot of I mean, at the beginning, we just had like the basic test case. Submit something to the hardware with the GPU hangman activated. Wait until the kernel noticed that the hardware didn't do anything, resets the GPU, and that crashed boxes, and ha we had deadlocks or locking issues in general, things that wasn't properly reset. Nowadays, we actually have like GPU hangs versus something else. For example, we noticed that if you have a GPU hang at the pending page flip, we actually deadlock. So we have a test case for that now, and the dialog is always not fixed. Then we notice, okay, if you have a cheap, you hang on the page flip, and the mode set pending, then we dialog again. So we have a test case for that, and 
uh, fix the bug in the kernel. There. And then the next thing was like GPU hang versus suspend resume. Again, there was some deadlock in there and we, we didn't clean up things properly. So nowadays GPU reset actually works mostly on the software side. And I mean GPUs are extremely hang happy pieces of hardware. So having reliable GPU reset support is really important for a somewhat decent user experience. <coughs> so that helped a lot. Nowadays, I mean, I mean, people, if you wouldn't yell like crazy into DMESC to please report this and supply the error state that we dump, uh, I don't think people would actually notice that it hangs. So, um, What's kind of planning the for the future? One thing we currently can't really test at all are crazy output devices. For example, we have 4K support in the, in the, in the Intel driver, but like no one has a 4K screen. Or maybe there's one developer who's a 4K screen and QA has one machine which occasionally runs with a 4K screen. So we have like no test coverage at all. So or, or 3D support, which we also have, and all these cry or 10 bits per pixel output support for, for uh, professional workstation display panels and that, all that kind of stuff. We, we can't test these code paths. And there's a lot of software logic that deals with these output configurations. Even before you, you see a pixel on the screen, there's so much things that can go wrong. So the next thing goal for testing techniques for me is uh, uh, I want to be able to inject arbitrary output configurations, EDIDs, uh, and kind of fake all, all the thing which is outside of the connector so that we can test a full case support, insane edit, EDIDs, the EDID policy could be tested like that by injecting uh, yeah, slightly corrupted things. Uh, all, all the special pipe configuration stuff that we need to do for special displays. And most of the outputs we have are, are fully dumb pipelines. So VGA obviously doesn't have a back channel, HDMI doesn't have a back channel. Display pool has one, so that would require a bit more work to, to really fake an output, a display port sync. So that's probably going to be the second step. But yeah, that, that that will allow us to test an entire new class of, of, of box uh, in a fully automated way. There's also uh, multi-pipe, multi-display panel support is, is a very big topic here. We, since Ivy Bridge, we have like three pipe support and it kind of doesn't work mostly. Or we, at least we're really good at breaking it because it's a pain to test with three displays. So one of the goals here is also to just in-check three displays that are suitable for, for, for multi-pipe for multi configurations, just test whether it still works. So that's kind of the testing technique from the, the, the next big thing. Uh, the other thing more on the infrastructure, dealing with a kernel mode setting interface is still a real pain. There's an awful lot of boilerplate code that we have duplicated. Selecting like the output configuration that you actually want is, yeah, re requires tons of, of stupid boilerplate code. So I, I hope we can uh, come up with a better helpful library a a a interface there to, to make writing test cases simpler and easier. Probably in combination with the output injection, pardon, the output injection uh, framework stuff so that we can say, I'd like to have three displays with that, just make it happen somehow. I don't care how. Whether you inject or whether you select real displays. And the last thing is kind of pipe dream of mine. I mean, all this testing here is pretty much Intel only. And none of the other DRM drivers kind of have even the glimpse of a automated test suite. There's a bunch of tools and things you can use to exercise features, but that's all done by developers occasionally as kind of, I actually booted it and not just compile it. 
So I, I'd love to see other people join in on the effort. I mean, the, the entire infrastructure, I think, is mostly Intel agnostic, besides that the, IGT, the I in ICT is obviously standing for Intel. <laughs> oh, but yeah, it, it looks like other driver teams kind of don't have the, the manpower to actually make it happen, unfortunately. Um, yeah, a bunch of links, probably more useful just for the people watching the web stream. Uh, the Intel GPU tools repository, the, the Piglet thing. There's a README in IGT which explains how to stitch all the stuff together. And uh, two, two blog posts for me, one is kind of the overview of the IGT infrastructure which also has links to uh, getting started, how to's and stuff. And the second one is kind of what I expect for test cases, test case coverage for uh, i915 patches for those who care. So summary, uh, testing and, and thinking about how we can actually validate features without blowing through tons of human time, and um, which is just not possible, is, is now really an integral part of i915. I, I think it shows we well, don't completely suck anymore. Uh, good infrastructure is kind of key. I mean, at first, writing test cases was a pain. Now we have all these kind of magic macros, piles of ioctal helpers, other helper things. So it, it's much more like just, you can actually concentrate on writing your test logic and trying to understand the bug, which very often is an interesting learning experience because you have the bug fix and you think you understand the bug and then you try to write a test case and notice you have no clue at all. Which does happen uh, shockingly often. So good, good infrastructure, good helpers is, is key. Locally we can also, if you're using Piglet, we can like reuse quite a lot from the uh, bigger uh, graphics community. And for testing kernel graphics driver, I think the big concern currently and ongoing to the future is coming up with testing techniques to actually like provoke bugs, R run through the, the, the code pass that you want to test. Because a lot of, via hardware drivers, a lot of the stuff is just goes out there and disappears. And we kind of need to create a feedback pa uh, path to, yeah, make it possible to like, for example, the display CRCs or the, the GPU hangman. How can we hang or fake a GPU hang with, without killing the entire box and that kind of stuff? So, uh, questions? Uh, this mic, yeah. Yeah, there's. Oh yeah, here's first. Yeah, no, it does. Uh, you mentioned GPU hangs, and obviously re resetting your GPU is great as a workaround, but the uh, golden target is to avoid a GPU hang in the first place, right? Well, when possible. Uh, yeah, well, th the thing is, I mean, GPU hang obviously can be just a kernel bug, or we missed the workaround bit some way. Yeah. Uh, but very often it's like just like 6F. Like, sorry, your user space just crashed. Yeah. But the kernel noticed that. And, and that's actually, nowadays the blurb we dump into DMISC is like, your GPU hanged, and then like an entire paragraph of this could be a user space bug, explaining exactly where to file it so that we can efficiently reassign it. That, that was my question. So if you want to get rid of GPU bugs, resetting your GPU is a good workaround, but I was wondering if you had an infrastructure or a mean for people to report the hangs so that you can investigate them to fix them. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, we had that since quite a while, actually. I think three, four years. Uh, we, at first, we dumped the, the GPU state, or at least interesting bits and pieces, a bunch of registers, the, the ring buffers, and the thing we suspect was the batch buffer, 
occasionally we guess wrong. I mean, you can't dump the entire two gigabytes. We dump that in the debugfs. Nowadays, we dump it as a blob file into sysfs, and dmesh tells you like, grab. Yeah, Greg is shaking his head. <laughs> we we clove like 16 megabytes of memory if a GPU hang happens. And okay, thanks. Yeah, we, we have that. And the DMISC explains to the user, grab this file, go to the free desktop, Buxilla, file this bug against Intel DRM, and we get them. Um, in the very beginning, you're talking about you constantly build and do all the tests and then push to next and Dave pulls that into his next branch for the next kernel. What do you do for testing on, like Linus is true today, how are you getting bug fixes only are acceptable now? Are you testing his tree and then sending him separate patches? Or are you never testing against Linus's tree? Um, the, the, we have a bunch of, uh, or I have a bunch of patches nowadays, and QA is somewhat limited, so they can just test one branch. So I, I have like my local integration tree where everything gets pulled together and they have like the nightly runs. But, but I mean, if I find a bug today, you can't, I can't pick it out of Dave's next tree to get it, Linus's tree to get it stable. Where do you, where does patch, how that patch flow work? Oh, there's, there's a separate branch for, and patch flow for fixes. Oh, okay, all right. So fixes get faster. That, that's for, oh. That, the, the next flow is for fetches. Uh, bug fixes obviously get fast tracked, and we, we we're not going to install them for like a month. That's what I'm worried about. Okay. No, we, okay. you get your stable patches, like you the entire. You do a great job with stable patches. I wish other people. I, I don't think I'm doing. <laughs> well, just because you said a lot of them. Yeah, we, we yeah, have a lot of bugs that we have to fix. So. Yeah, you have lots of bugs. <laughs> you don't see all the patches you should get, but kind of don't say. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, one thing is also because. Due to the one week delay for QA, uh, features close like one week before, at least one week before the merge window opens, which means by, by the time I actually have like all the crap in the merge, merge window for me is like the easiest time uh, of the, the release cycle because everyone is busy br fixing the other people's breakage and no one reports DRM and 15 bucks. And we actually, nowadays, we don't have too many awful regressions. So you guys have changed the tone. Really good job. I will commend you. It's gotten a lot better. Oh, Thank thanks. You. And yeah, the people have done a good job writing test cases and reviewing. I had more of a comment than a question. Um, you mentioned uh, other, other drivers in the kernel, other graphics drivers should jump in to IGT or use, use testing. And I wanted to emphasize that the the cross-checker that we've added to the i915 driver to check the what we think we're programming to the hardware versus what the hardware actually has has just been tremendously helpful, not only in getting bug reports from users, but it's, it's super helpful for new development. You know, for example, if I'm developing some new display feature or adding, an, adding support for a new platform, all of that cross-checking just catches almost everything before we even get it upstream. So I, I highly encourage the other drivers to implement a similar scheme where you've got a a set of state that you're that you're tracking in software, you you check it against what you read out from the hardware, and then report any any conflicts at that point. It's uh, it's a, a really a big feature. Yeah, I mean, we the state checker, like I, I said, it's essentially these two features, fast boot and atomic mode set that we're trying to make happen on upstream. But it turned out that little C function with which just compares two structures is is really valuable for development. But yeah, the, the problem is you need the other two pieces to make it happen. If you don't pre-compute your state and track it like in a separate data structure, you don't have anything to compare. If you don't have a hardware readout code, you, you, yeah, the other piece is missing. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, you mentioned making the driver the test cases also work for other drivers, but I looked at Intel GPU tests and they pretty much all assume that you have an Intel GPU and never run another drive except for a few of the tests which do the cross-checking. Well, I mean, obviously, currently they all work on Intel GPU tools. We, we're not going to write test cases for Raiden or something. But uh, as part of 
allowing our own QA to run test cases or enumerate test cases on their build infrastructure. I reworked all the tests so you can run them on any machine and they properly skip. And I think the most value would be in the, in the kernel mode setting tests. At least kind of the generic just bash on things stuff. And I, I heard that Raiden has CRC registers too, so I guess they could expose that and we could add a little shim library to, to like create frame buffers and grab mm -hmm. CRCs. And then we could share these tests. Yeah. Like they have the same problem with the cursor could drop off the screen one pixel too early, so. Okay, thanks. Um. Questions? Okay. It's okay. We have time. No, oh, wait. Yeah, um, Radeon is, is, is basically hitchhiking on the QA ins infrastructure of the closed source driver. So we have CSU registers as well. That's that's correct. But uh, uh, we basically can't publish them and uh, just get test results internally. That's the only yeah, problem the, with that. I, I mean, I didn't tell that story, but getting permission to expose the CSC registers was a long, long fight with the Hallway guys. I, I can bear. I can go, uh, understand and it very good, yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, the, the actual. Miss, miss. Uh, the, I think the Hallway guys mostly use it with. I mean, they have like the actual CRC model with the, the coefficients, so they, they can actually check whether one pixel is accurate. The only thing we are allowed to do is like compare two frames for equal or not equal. So they didn't allow us to expose the CRC in the details. Just like is the register. And that's also how we expose it through DebugFS. It's, I think, 5D words because that's the most any platform ever dumps. Yeah, mo usually it's less. It's kind of strangely split. So, yeah, but it was a long fight to get these CRCs into upstream code. Any more yeah. question? Okay, then thank you, Daniel. Thanks a lot for listening. So next presentation is going uh, to be about...